yeah, I think we can get started. Um, so the URL for the traces is right there at the top now. <laughs> um, so first of all, thanks for, for coming. It's really great to see such a large group here. Um, that's certainly the largest workshop we ever had. And um, it's probably, or quite certainly, also the, the largest group of uh, Bro users or potential Bro users in a single room so far, I think. So that's pretty exciting to, to all of us. And um, I'm sure we will have a great time. Um, so this, this workshop um, will be kind of a mix of a few presentations, not too many, and mainly exercises for you guys to do on your on your, on your own laptop, and, and just to get out the tribro and to do various things with with guidance and um, 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 and help as we can provide. Um, I'll start with uh, a brief overview talk, just kind of summarizing a bit of the basic philosophy of bro, a bit of the architecture and the history, because I know that there are like kind of very different expertise levels in terms of Bro in this, in this room. Um, so some have been using it for a long time already, and, and some are just trying to get into it. So, so I'm trying to get us all on the same page, but I will keep it short, and I will just kind of touch the surface. And many of the things I'm going to talk about, um, we will go into much more depth um, over the next two and a half days. Did everybody get the URL? <laughs> So by downloading it from NCSA, you will do the ICSI sysadmins in Berkeley a favor, uh, <laughs> because we have a very small uplink, actually. Generally, this, this whole workshop is supposed to be interactive, so feel free to ask questions anytime. Um, we are recording the presentations. Um, so if you ask a question during a presentation, please use your mics so that uh, it gets recorded. We are not recording. Um, the exercises or discussions in between. So feel free to say things you don't really want to have taped. <laughs> yeah, Adam? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the password is on the back. <laughs> All right, so basically, um, this is my outline for, for this, this, this roughly 30 minute introduction. So, I'm going to talk about the philosophy and the architecture of the system a bit. and. So the point here I want to make is that Bro is really this framework for network traffic analysis, which um, doesn't really uh, predetermine what you can do, but it gives you a lot of flexibility to, to work with. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the history. Um, it's coming out of research, which um, is kind of um, the reason you see certain things the way they are. And as we are to operations more and more, and this is actually our current focus, is to make Bro um, much more usable from the operations perspective, as most of you guys um, are familiar with, um, we, it, it's still kind of helpful to keep this, this research background a bit in mind to, to interpret certain things. And then I will talk just mainly to introduce a bit of terminology, the various components of the system, the, the, the internal architecture, um, show some log files, some scripts, and, and um, introduce this cluster architecture we use for, for load balancing. So um, let me start by just trying to answer this question many people ask, what actually is Bro? And it's always hard to kind of um, describe it because it's so different from other systems. And um, one way to do that is actually to look at other systems and, and see what they provide and then compare Bro against that. And um, if you look at um, like the typical toolbox people use in their daily incident response uh, work, they, they usually use some tool for packet capturing, like, like TCP dump, right, and then some other tool for traffic inspection, like, like Wireshock, which actually goes into the protocols and extracts the fields out there and gives you the semantic context. Um, TCPDOM can, of course, do a little bit of that as well. And then um, there are tools for doing attack detection, like, like Snort, typical IDS-style pattern matching. You give it a large library of signatures, and it does uh, basically report whatever it finds. And um, you have another set of tools and data sources for doing logging, so that you get a kind of an, an overview of what's going on in your network. 
NetFlow gives you this, this kind of flow level activity summary of who talked to whom at, at which time. And at the host level, there's syslog, which just kind of records what systems are doing. And you can aggregate that centrally if you want, right? <clears throat> One interesting observation is that, that most people who are using these tools, they, in addition, often use also scripting language on top of that in, in, in either Python or Perl to kind of tie these together, to pass the output, to aggregate, to correlate, to basically get the, to the interesting stuff which these tools provide in some form. Um, if we look at Bro, one way to, 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 to look at it is actually to basically draw a line here and say um, all these various layers, that is something Bro all provides internally as part of the system. Um, it does packet capture. It has lots of protocol analyzers, which, which dig deep into the traffic. It can do attack detection, of course. And it does extensive log recording so that you just see what's going on on a very high level. Um, However, the main part actually is this last part, and that is Bro comes with its own scripting language. And, and that basically ties all these layers together inside the single system and gives you all this flexibility, abstraction, and, and these high-level data structures, which make it really easy to work with in Python or Perl, but specific to this domain and specific to these layers so that you can actually kind of work very nicely with them. So that's why often I call Bro just, it's kind of a domain-specific Python. So that's my short version of describing what Bro is, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a scripting language, which gives you lots of flexibility, but also comes with lots of pre-built functionality, just like the Python standard library. Um, lots of functionality, which is just there for you to use, but it doesn't force you to use it in a certain way. So in this sense, Bro is more than <laughs> the sum of the pieces here. Um, a few words about the philosophy, and that is, um, I mean, I, I guess most of you know that <laughs> it's, it's really different than other IDSs, right? Um, so, so I always recommend, so if, if you start trying to get into Bro, best, the best thing to do is just reset your idea of what an IDS is, because it's different. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's necessarily better, but it's different, right? Um, so and it's this, this framework, already said that, and, and actually it's primarily an intrusion detection system, but people use it for all kinds of stuff, understanding network traffic, so uh, including research, including health monitoring, stuff like that. Um, it can accommodate a range of detection approaches because it's by, uh, by design, it's, um, it's neutral to the specific way of detecting things. So it's, it can do the full range of um, what, the, what you usually call misuse detection, normally based detection, specification based detection. So basically, it's, it's a programming language, right? So it can do a lot of that. It's highly stateful. It tracks a lot of state, in particular the application layer. So it can remember things and use that for decisions later. And it supports forensics in the sense that, um, it, as I already said, it, it just logs stuff it sees. So that by itself is often extremely helpful. And target audience. Um, so, so, so you're targeting uh, sites of all sizes, but in particular, it works very well for these large-scale environments I know many of you guys are from, um, because it gives you this additional flexibility that other systems don't have. And it also is very effective with these liberal security policies you often have, for example, in academic environments, where by default, things aren't just allowed. And you can't just block all the ports. Um, you are not sure uh, whether anybody might use them or not, because on a campus network, they will use them. Um, it requires some kind of network savviness from the operator. So, so um, um, it, you should have either already have a pretty good understanding of your network or be willing to kind of get to that level to, to, to understand what's, what's going on there. Um, and it, it, it requires this a bit of a unix mindset in the sense that it's a command line utility um, and it, it's, uh, on the other hand, fully customizable to adapt to your needs. But you kind of need to spend a bit of effort on, on kind of getting to that level. And that's why we're doing this workshop, right, to, to get you there. Um, in preparation for this talk, I actually looked a bit at Bro's history. And that is um, something which is interesting. So basic Bro is a very old system, even though many people don't really know that. It's, I asked Vern when he wrote the first line of code. That was in 1995. So he went back to his email archive <laughs> and was trying to figure out when was the first email, basically referencing code being written. And it was 1995. So that is when Bro started. And um, 1996, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab started using it operationally. So that is pretty cool. And they, they, since then, they, they have been doing that. And um, then since 1995, when it all began, until today, there was a lot of work going into the system pretty much every year. And I went through the changes file. And it's probably too small to read. I'm not going through it. But uh, I wanted to convey that there's a lot of work like every year. And there are certain milestones. Um, 
um, in there, like the, the, the communication system, which we added in 2003, or this dynamic protocol detection where it can do um, application analysis independent of the ports the protocol is actually running on. That was in 2007, and we added this, this broad control management framework in 2009. Um, so, and just now we arrived at Bro 2.0. But basically, there's a lot of work going into the system um, over that time. Um, and this is kind of the, the view from the change log, so the actual code changes. There's a second kind of view to do that, and that is the academic view. There are lots of publications have been written about various parts of Bro because at their time, they actually moved ahead or advanced the state of the art in, in, in network research and in security research by introducing all these new concepts. Um, so basically, every entry here is, is, is a uh, publication, at a, usually at a pretty top venue. Um, so and that is the, the, the thing to keep in mind about Bro. It has this research heritage. So it's coming out of the research world. Um, and um, the original paper, this, this Usenix paper, introducing the Bro system itself, or better, the, the journal version coming, coming um, a year after that, is probably one of the most cited papers in intrusion detection research. Um, so this, 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 this academic background is something to keep in mind. Um, because uh, it explains certain things. So, so much of Bro is coming out of research projects, funded by research money. Um, then the nice thing about Bro, which makes it quite different from many other academic um, projects, efforts, is that, as I, as I said on the previous slide, essentially from the beginning, it was not only used in research, but it was also used in operations. And it has been uh, since then. And, and there's this constant feedback loop, basically, has been going on between operational um, experiences and, and, and academic research, which was very fruitful for, for both sides. The downside is that for a long time we had this rather limited engineering resources. So if, you, if you're funded by research grants, um, you really don't have the money to write documentation. <laughs> so that is what we unfortunately uh, suffer from still today. Um, so, so that is kind of why for a long time Bro was not really in the shape as um, many of you um, rightfully so would expect a, a, a decent open source project to be in. So this has recently changed um, because the National Science Foundation has uh, decided to fund specifically Bro development, software development um, at ICSI in Berkeley and over here at, at NCSA in a collaborative project. So we have now full-time engineers working on Bro and all the work which went into Bro 2.0 was funded by this project. And this is something which actually moves us forward quite a bit and, and which um, we will continue um, for, for a while. We'll be able to continue for a while and which, um, which, which kind of allows us to focus on, on these capabilities and user experience that we couldn't do for a while. The objective here is basically to come to an eventually sustainable development model to increase the community. Um, that's why it's so great to see so many people in this room. So eventually, we want Bro really to not to be dependent on the small team of researchers as, as ICSI, right? So, so we want basically the community to contribute um, to the project. Um, so much for kind, kind of this his, history background. Just really quick, Bro um, is um, getting to deployment and architecture. And, and Bro is, I mean, it's deployed like any other IDS. So you plug into some central point of your network and it gets all the copy of all the packets and it looks at the packets and tries to understand what's going on. It runs on commodity platforms, uh, standard PC, standard network interface cards. We do support FreeBSD, Linux, and, and macOS. It runs on some other systems as well, but these are those where we make actually sure it runs. Um, so, so that's usually one of our recommendations. And if you look at the internals of the system, we find um, that there is, it's kind of a layered architecture internally. Right? So, so, so as I said, we, we tap into the network traffic, we get the packets, and the first layer where the packets arrive at is, is this what we call it the event engine. And that's where kind of all the protocol decoding takes place. Right? That is where the HTTP decoder really kind of looks at the HTTP protocol and gets the URL out there and the HTTP headers out there. So that is kind of essentially processing traffic at, at line speed. And it's distilling this, this kind of high level perspective of traffic out there in the sense of events, which are the kind of the key steps of activity. Like there was a connection established, there was an HTTP page requested or the, res the server responded with the following status code. So this kind of abstraction, um, that's what, what we call events, and they are sent upstream to the second layer, and that is um, the policy script interpreter. That is where the, the domain-specific Python comes in, right? It's, it's kind of the user interface of the system. That is where you, as the user, interact with it. And that's where you, then, based on these events, can say, okay, if there was a connection established, then please do something. 
So in this, um, and this event model basically reduces the volume of data quite a bit. So this is not operating at, at, at kind of packet line rate anymore. So you can do much more, and you can keep state, and you can remember stuff at that layer. I have two quick examples uh, of, of ProScript just to kind of convey the idea, and we will kind of look much more into that during the rest of this workshop. So say somebody tasked you with reporting all web requests for files called PassVD. Yeah, pass that, uh, password. Um, this is the bro code for that. And don't get scared. <laughs> it's actually pretty simple. So basically, this is boilerplate, this, this, this upper part. And it says there is an event, right? I said basically this event engine sends events <coughs> upstream. It says here was an HTTP request. And then it executes this body of this event handler every time it sees an HTTP request on the wire. right? And, and, and it gives it a number of arguments. It gives it the connection and, and the method, like the get in a, in a request and the URI most importantly. And then you write just a little bit piece of script code, as you would write, could, would write a piece of Python and say, OK, if I'm looking for, for web requests, so if the method is, is get, and um, I'm looking for password, so if the uh, you decoded URI in this case matches this regular expression here, then I do an alarm. And notice it's just the internal function to do an alarm, and we will do that later. So this is really simple. I mean, it's just two lines of code, essentially, plus some boilerplate around. Um, my second example is most probably the, the simple, simplest scan detector you can imagine. So, so if you say your task is instead um, to count the number of failed connection attempts per source address, so you need to keep a counter per, per address. Um, and this is it's essentially uh, four or five lines of code you need for that. And this time, basically, you, you hook into this event connection rejected, which the event engine generates every time there was a send packet followed by a reset packet from the responder. Right? So, so that is, the responder doesn't like to talk to this guy. So he, he, he rejects the connection. And then this piece of code gets executed here. And in this case, we keep a global, as I said, we keep a table of counters mapping addresses to the current value, how many attempts you have already seen. And every time you get a connection rejected, we look at the source address, which is part of this, this record coming in here. And we will look at all, that, all of that data. Um, this dollar is actually, it's like a dot in C. So, so just for those, um, if it's confusing, it's the dereference operator, just for like syntax reasons in the language. Um, we increase the counter in this table, remember the new value for next time, and if some threshold is reached, we generate an alert. So it's, it's a very kind of straightforward way to express a very basic scan detector. Keeping state, correlating stuff together. And again, it's, it's just no need to kind of understand every single piece here right now. And the good news is, so you can write this code yourself, but the good news is actually Bo 2.0 comes with more than 10,000 lines of such code, essentially. Um, much more sophisticated, of course, because Seth did a great job in writing all this. And, um, but basically, you, you kind of can leverage this. <laughs> you can leverage all of Seth's knowledge uh, by just starting Bro, and it will just pull it in, just as the Python standard library provides you with all this stuff you don't need to touch yourself. Um, the scripts generate alarms with this notice function we, we saw on the previous slide. But they also pro uh, produce these, these log files I already, already mentioned. And, and it's very easy to customize and extend both the alarming and the logging. Just to show two examples for these logs, um, and that is something which has changed quite a bit in 2.0. So for those who know the 1.5 series, log files in 2.0 look completely different. Um, we restructured them because they were really hard to deal with. They were unstructured. They were hard to parse. They were hard to kind of distill and put into databases. And, and, and um, so they look different now. And it's also much easier to get to them. So the, what you do, you, if you just start Bro with an interface, and wait a bit, you get a con log, just as in the past. But notice that you don't give any further scripts here. So in Pro 1.5, you would have to get at least TCP of con, and weird, and notice. And, um, so you just start Bro without further scripts. You get this connection log. And this is how it looks. I hope it's not too small. So basically, it's now column oriented, right? So, so you um, get a header of, of columns with um, names, which kind of specify what's, what's in that column. And then it starts with the timestamp on the left. And then in this case, the originator address, originator port, originator, um, ah, sorry, responder host, and, and so on. And this is basically one line per connection. It's a bit like, like the NetFlow, just with TCP semantics and your full connections. It's all like tab-separated values now, so it's really easy to parse. The header 
uh, it's actually a bit more extensive. So if, if you actually look at the log file, there's type information in there. So you can figure out what column is the time and, and, and do some automated processing with that. So the goal was really to, to make it easy. Um, I, I printed two of these connections in bold because there's also, just with the same command line at the, as at the top, there's an HTTP.log generated as well with HTTP traffic. And this now has uh, one line per HTTP request. If you compare that against 1.5, there was, was a big mess of, of like lots of lines all relating to the same uh, HTTP session, so, um, or to the same request. So we get here like, like just uh, clearly structured a single line for each request. In this case, we, we see uh, again a timestamp and, and the originator is, and the originator host and pod. I skipped a number of columns. And then the, the host of the um, server taken out of the server header from the responder side. The UI requested the status code with, with which the um, server responded in the user agent. And actually, much more is in there. So you just get that readily by just running bro. Um, yeah, and again, so, so we have a number of exercises which actually will dig into these log files and, and, and um, kind of play a bit with how do you analyze them, how you get to certain information, how you kind of aggregate stuff in there, and how you, how you potentially post-process it. Um, the last part of my, my overview here is that just um, introducing a bit more of te terminology in the sense of that Bro is a pretty large project these days. It has a number of subcomponents, and I just want to kind of show what are the various pieces going into Bro or going into the Bro distribution or into potentially into your Bro installation. And um, if I go back to this, this original diagram I had, basically Bro tapping into the wire, in practice, it can be more complicated, actually, or more complex or more sophisticated, if you want. Um, because usually, um, these days, you don't run the bro from the command line itself, at least not in a, an operational environment, but you get this interface we call bro control. It's kind of an interactive shell management interface to bro, which does all this kind of task you need to do in an operational setting. It starts the bro, it stops it, 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 it um, aggregates the log files, it can update the configuration on the fly. Um, it checks the configuration before you push it out so that to make sure that you didn't have a like like a super typo in, in your in your uh, script or something like that. So it's it's this all this kind of routine task you need for operating um, a system, and that's where you primarily interact with. Then we have that is pretty new. Um, we have an, uh, a repository for additional functionality for contributed scripts. It's actually there's not that much in there right now, but that's actually kind of a focus area which we want to really extend and collect scripts from the community and make it really easy to use them in broad. So in addition to the many scripts we ship with the distribution, um, there's this external pool of scripts, or there will be this external pool of scripts which you can easily pull in to get new functionality. Bro itself, the kind of the bro process, can communicate with other bro instances. So we have a communication system in there. Um, so you can, can have and run a number of other bros either just on the next box or on a different subnetwork, for example. And you can send these events, which I showed on the earlier slide, which are normally sent from the event engine to the, to the local script interpreter. You can send them over the network, actually, to the other bro and process there. And there's kind of a very generic capability, which enables a number of applications. So, so we, um, we, we can do loop balancing with that. We can do um, distributed intrusion detection with that. It's, it's a very kind of uh, flexible way of exchanging information between independent bro instances. Sometimes you don't want to exchange state with other bros, but with other tools. And for that, there's a client library written in C called Broccoli. It's the bro, it's the bro client communication library. It's a C library which you can essentially link to any C application to talk to bro. And then any C application can send events to bro or uh, receive events back. People are using that, for example, to, to feed syslog data into bro, but just basically every line of syslog turns into an event, fed into bro, and bro can process whatever comes in. Um, C is kind of a low-level language, um, but there are script-level uh, bindings for it. So, so currently, we have Python bindings for, bro for, for Broccoli. We have Ruby bindings. And brand new, we have a prototype of Perl bindings, which are just now, uh, are actually, like a couple of weeks ago, I think we put them online on, on, the, on the development page. Um, so this is, again, um, something which, which is, is a great capability to have to interface bro, with other stuff and, and, and to, to be very flexible. 
Um, then there are a number of kind of smaller, further sub-projects, and I'm not going to talk about them. I just want to mention them because you might hear them occasionally. A bit tiny, huh? <laughs> um, so it's it's. Uh, so some, some smaller tools, it's, it's a protocol parser generator, it's like, like little tools to analyze network traffic. And um, I don't really, uh, you don't really need to know much about them. Um, but the nice part here is that essentially if you download the broad distribution, the broad 2.0, or currently it's the broad 2.0 better, all these parts which are kind of encircled in red here, that is part of the distribution. So even though there are lots of subcomponents, um, just by downloading the, the main distribution, you get all of them. And they're actually set up in a way that they build automatically and that they are kind of installed as necessary what, what parts they need. So that it's, it's, it's working really well in the, in the new version in particular. However, if for some reason you want to get to these individual projects independently, um, each of these kind of yellow boxes is a separate Git repository now. And um, you can get to that <laughs> on, our, on our Git server. So, in case, for some reason, you, I don't know, just want Broccoli, for example, because you want to run it on a different system to send stuff to your central bro, just download Broccoli separately. Um, yeah, that is the bro ecosystem. There's one additional piece, and, and we will be talking about this a lot in this workshop, I suppose, there's um, this, this cluster setup. So, so the, the, the observation is that many of the large networks you guys are in, a single bro box can't just, uh, just cannot handle all the traffic. Right. So, so what we what we developed for that is this, this clusterized setup, and in a bro cluster, basically this this middle part looks a bit different. And what happens there is so we still take the packet stream, but before we send them to any bro, we send them to a load balancer, and that is essentially a per packet uh, load balancing dispatcher, which steers slices of the traffic to individual bro instances, and then each of as many bro instances as you need works on a separate slice of the traffic and, and just kind of examines the slide, not that slice, and um, they actually talk to each other so that they kind of, as a whole, have the, 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 the kind of broad vision of what's going on. So they correlate stuff between them and they don't miss anything there, therefore. Now, um, handling such a kind of multi-process setup is a bit tedious, therefore bro control actually takes care of that. So that is all built into bro control. You can rather easily just by telling Bro where to run these individual, individual Bro instances, just by telling that to Bro control, it will just manage all this for you. And, and you, just as you interacted um, with the standalone instances, just where you say, okay, start Bro, stop Bro, um, uh, get the logs, whatever. Um, this works in exactly the same way in the Bro control setting. And it will just kind of transparently manage all these instances for you. So this remains your user interface, and you don't really have to adjust much. In terms of the terminology, so usually we call these uh, pieces, the load balancer, we call that usually the front end, and the bro instances are the, the worker nodes, and bro control are the system running, bro control is the manager node, because that's where you're running on. One piece to keep in mind here is if, um, if I say node, um, kind of the, the default setup for such a cluster is you have multiple boxes, as many PCs as you need to handle the stream of traffic. However, these days, Many of these boxes have, have so many cores in there um, that you can just as well parallelize stuff on that box. And so you can just as well run kind of a cluster in a box in the form that you just spawn multiple bro processes on the same box. And bro control supports that as well and will just kind of take care of it if you tell it to, to set up five worker nodes on the same physical box. You need to kind of mess a bit with the load balancing for that, of course. So, and, but we, have, uh, we will talk more about that later. That pretty much concludes my talk. The last thing I wanted to do is show the bro team. <laughs> so basically, most of these people are here in the room and are here to help. And they will kind of, during the exercises, walk around and you can talk to them. And I basically wanted to, you to be able to put some, some names to faces here. Um, Vern, of course, started this whole project and he's the reason we are all here today. Um, he couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, but uh, yeah, he is he's kind of uh, still leading this all. And the rest of the team is currently distributed primarily between ICSI in Berkeley and, and um, NCSA over here. And the only other person who is not in the room here is Christian. Christian is uh, Mr. Broccoli, so he wrote the, the Broccoli library. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then I hand over to Seth, actually, to walk us through the agenda.